Thank you. So I'm actually here to talk about types of jam. So raspberry and rosemary. And don't worry, there's plenty of more corny jokes to come. Uh, so I'm going to talk about TypeScript. So you might be wondering who is this American, again, speaking. Um, so I'm actually from New York, but I live in Norway now. So um, you're partially wrong if you just thought I was a basic American. Uh, I work for Vector Media Group, so I'm head of develop development for Vector Media Group. It's an agency based in New York. And so my focus in Norway has been to expand operations in Norway to build out a team and also get clients in, in, in Norway. And actually, I'm moving to Paris in August. So if anyone has any good contacts or recommendations for restaurants or bars, please talk to me afterwards. Um, as you mentioned, I'm very interested in music. Uh, my family comes from, from a group of music developers and um, producers. And so I listen to about 122 songs per day. So I'm always pretty much plugged in. So if you want to talk about music, please grab me as well. I started using TypeScript in 2015, uh, personally, and then 2016, professionally. And it's, it's hard for me to imagine not using TypeScript for a large project these days. And actually, professionally, we had a client that we wrote the project and did everything and finished it. And we wrote it in regular JavaScript. And they actually came back and said, we're not going to pay you until you transfer this all to TypeScript. So that was good motivation to learn it. It was pretty painful. But once we finished, we actually saw the benefit and really were kind of convinced that TypeScript was a really good way to write JavaScript. And I also say sometimes that writing JavaScript without TypeScript is kind of like if you need to go to the store to buy some jam, uh, if you get in the car, it's kind of not like not wearing a seatbelt. So sure, you can do it and you'll get there, but it's not really safe. And there's um, some drawbacks to not doing that. So maybe to keep with this analogy, maybe if you're going to the store to pick up some jam and you're walking, you wouldn't need TypeScript. So I, I would say that's like building out a prototype or something like that. So if you're really doing something very quickly and don't need type checks or a static system, then maybe you could do without TypeScript. But I think if you're really building a serious application, TypeScript is definitely something that you could use. So I think all of us have a love-hate relationship with JavaScript. Um, there's a lot of different types of tooling for JavaScript, and there's a lot of things that are happening, and it moves very fast. And it's hard to know like what to read up on and what to follow and what to use. So I think it's 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 valuable to know where to spend your time. And TypeScript is something that's been around since 2012. And I think it's something that's really worth investing in. And so there's a lot of JavaScript jokes. And I think we can all agree that JavaScript is not going anywhere. Obviously, JavaScript has some quirks and some interesting features. And um, in this case, it leads to an injured baby. So that's not good. Um, and then also JavaScript has some faults and some non-intuitive results. And so that can lead to some interesting bugs and some interesting features, which you could call, uh, it's either a bug, it's not a bug, it's a feature. So maybe that's something you can actually say it's a good thing. But I think we, all, we can all agree that JavaScript has its issues. However, this is not going to be a talk where I'm bashing JavaScript or saying, OMG, JavaScript is the worst and you shouldn't write in it. I think we can all agree that JavaScript's not going anywhere. and um, part of my focus with building out a team and building out clients is to make sure that we're picking well-established and efficient technologies. And I've seen over the years that TypeScript is something that is well-established and efficient. So like I said earlier, JavaScript was introduced by Microsoft in 2012. Um, and Microsoft um, is now the GitHub owner, obviously, so they're an established company. Um, they open sourced it, and what it adds is an optional static typing system to JavaScript. Um, so it adds an extra layer around JavaScript and gives you some extra methods and logic around JavaScript. And it's called a superset of JavaScript. So what that means is that it sits on top of JavaScript and compiles down to JavaScript. So the compiler knows your variables, your types, your parameters, and is able to use those properties to then make an optimized transpiled code that can perform type checks. Um, you're also seeing these days a lot of tech, a lot of languages adopting static type systems. So I don't know if people saw, I think the, the other day, um, Stripe is working on a project where they're actually adding a static type system to Ruby 
called Sorbet. And then also Python, um, another dynamic language is adding in MyPy, which is an optional static type system, system for Python. So you're kind of seeing the adoption as technologies mature and companies mature, the adoption of a static type system. And of course, JavaScript has TypeScript, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more. So is it worth it? That was actually me when I first picked up TypeScript and started working with it. I was skeptical at best because I'd written a lot of JavaScript and really was quite comfortable in writing JavaScript without having to worry about specifying an interface and doing all this extra stuff. But I think what I found is that types really do help. Having some clarity in your code and knowing exactly what you're writing and what you're going to be working with in a parameter and a function helps a lot. And I don't know about you guys, but code I wrote last week, I can barely remember what I was trying to accomplish. So when I go back to that code and I see everything very specified and explicit, it's much easier to pick up that code. And if you want to refactor some code, you have everything annotated. So it's much easier to actually go in and change those properties. The other thing um, that I want to mention is that TypeScript is not a replacement for um, testing. So if you still, if you adopt TypeScript, you still want to have TDD implemented in your project and still have robust test systems because it's been shown that static type systems do not actually decrease bug density. So even though you have that extra layer of security, it's still valuable to have um, testing in place for your project. The other thing um, that I want to mention is that there's self-documenting code. So um, obviously in JavaScript, there's JS docs. You can specify the, the block above the code with some comments, and you can say the parameters and the return types. With TypeScript, that's kind of out of the box because you have to specify that when you're writing a function. JavaScript future is now. So with JavaScript and TypeScript, you have out of the box access to the latest ES6 features, so fat arrows, async, await. And so obviously, you could use that with Babel, but with TypeScript, that's out of the box. So you can start writing with the next level features. And then Microsoft team is actively adopting and adding in those, different, those uh, ability to use the different um, next level ES features. Um, JavaScript is TypeScript. So like I said before, it's a superset of JavaScript. So, sorry. So JavaScript is actually valid TypeScript. So you can actually write a JavaScript file and then change the file name to .ts and the compiler will actually know to compile that back down to type to JavaScript. So you can use it interchangeably. So that makes it a lot useful and a lot easier to change your existing code base from JavaScript to TypeScript. I'm going to show that a little bit later. So I'm going to show something now. Um, there's non-blocking errors. So if you're writing TypeScript and you have something you want to convert to TypeScript, uh, to JavaScript, sorry, and you, you can't see that. <clears throat> So you have something that is actually not compliant JavaScript, not compliant TypeScript. So in this case, you're specifying foo as a number, and you're trying to reevaluate and reassign foo to a string that's 456. So as we can see, there's this red marker to show the error is actually going to be something that is going to complain when you try to compile it. But the useful thing is that even if this is not good TypeScript, you can actually still compile it. I can't really see that. But. Examples. This examples. Okay. Sorry, one second. I'm just going to take this screen back. Okay. All right. So as we can see, we're going to try to compile this errors.ts file. And the compiler is going to complain, but it's still going to actually compile that file. So we try to run errors.js. It's going to give us out the output of 456, even though that's not good TypeScript, but it's still valid TypeScript because it's still compiling. The other useful thing is that TypeScript, if say you're picking up React and you need to figure out how to use React and you're still kind of learning it. Um, TypeScript gives you annotations using typings. So let me take the screen back again. 
So in this case, we're in our package.json, we're specifying the fact that we need uh, the React types package. And also what that gives us is the annotations for the React library. So say we're trying to pick up React, we can actually use those annotations to help us when we're developing. So if we then go to the file where we're using React, in this case, we're using the, uh, this property here, and we don't know what it does. When we actually want to see what it does, we can hover over that element. And with TypeScript, it will tell you what the parameters are and what the return type is. So you can kind of see that. But the useful thing is that using typings in our IDE, it will help us when we're picking up a new library or using those type annotations to help us figure out what um, the specifications are for that property or for that method. So hopefully you're maybe a little bit intrigued and are kind of interested in TypeScript. And so let's see if we can get started. And so one sec, I'm just going to change my uh, desktop so it mirrors. It's a little bit easier for me to see. Okay. So now we're mirroring so I can see the screen. And so how do you get started? So all we need are really two things to get started with TypeScript. We need the type specifying for Node, and we need the TypeScript package. So as you can see, we're just specifying those as dev dependencies. The other thing we're going to need is a tsconfig.json. And so here we're specifying the module, the target that the JavaScript is going to compile down to and no implicit any, which is important because if, we're having, if we have a function that doesn't specify the parameter, it's going to complain. And so if we have no implicit any here, it's going to help us out and actually tell us that we, shouldn't, we need to specify the parameter that we're using for no implicit any. Um, and then some other options here. So these are fairly straightforward as far as that goes. Now let's talk about the type system a little bit. So the, the main features that are in TypeScript are interfaces. Um, so let's, let's look at an interface to get a, kind of get a sense of what that is. So in this case, an interface is really a blueprint for a TypeScript object and specifying its properties. So when you compile a, uh, an interface, it doesn't actually compile down to anything in JavaScript. What it is, it's something that helps the compiler know what you're going to be specifying and your application. So in this case, we're importing this config interface, and we're saying that this return object here is this config interface that we specified. So the properties here match up to the interface we're specifying. So as you can see, it has version, property, active, and then within the config settings property, we're importing that other interface we specified. And so that matches up here. The next thing we'll talk about are functions. So as I mentioned before, if you have a function, you specify the parameters and you specify the return type. So in this case, the parameters are A, which is a number, B, and then this question mark behind it is saying that it's optional, and then C, which is also optional, and then returning a number, which is A again. So this is very useful because, again, we can see exactly what we're expecting in the, in the function, and we can also know exactly what we're returning back. Next thing I want to talk about are string literals. So as you can see here, Normally, we would specify a type. So usually, it would be like let foo is a number. However, in this case, we're saying let foo is actually a string of hello. And so what this is doing is saying that this type foo should always be hello. So if we then try to reassign foo to goodbye, it's going to complain and say goodbye is not assignable to type hello, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. So string literals are useful in this other example where we're using cardinal directions. So directions are always going to be north, east, south, and west. And so this, this abstraction is useful because we can always say these four directions can only be used for this type. So in this case, we're saying move one north, and then we misspelled 
north to north, which happens all the time. I don't know about you guys making typos, but now it's going to complain and say north is not assignable to the cardinal direction type of north, which is obviously an error. So we try to compile that. It's going to complain and say that that's not a valid assignment to that type. Next thing I want to talk about generics. So generics are a proper abstraction. And so if we go to examples and go to generics.js, so we have a queue. This queue takes in an item and we can push it on the queue and then pop it off the queue. So in this case, we're pushing on zero and then pushing on a string of one. And then say we try to pop it off and then run to precision. It's going to throw an error because this next item on the queue is actually a string and we're calling to precision on a string, which is not going to be valid. So if we, this is regular JavaScript, but say we want to make this over to TypeScript, how can we specify a good generic class? So first we, let's say we want to, we know we're only going to use numbers in this queue. So we can assign this item to be a number. And now if we try to do the same thing, it's going to complain before we actually try to run it. So that saves us time to, um, save us time when we're trying to run and execute it because we know what's going to be the error in the compile time. So this is very specific and kind of limits our queue to only accept numbers. But let's make a smarter queue, which is called IQ, which is a smarter queue. And so in this case, we can say the IQ is going to take in a generic type I. And then this I type is going to be pushed on the queue and it's going to return this I type as well. And so I can mean anything, but that's being specified when we pass it in. So in this case, we're passing in, and the generic type is going to be number. So now when we have this IQ class, it can take in a number. We very explicitly know it's going to be a number when it's returned and what it takes in. And the second example, we're passing IQ as a string. So as you can see, generics give you a really good abstraction away from saying explicit type, but rather a generic type that can then take in a generic type in this case, a number or a string, and then pass, pass that back out. So what I'm talking about next is refactoring into to TypeScript. So say you have a library that, or an application that you want to try out and convert it to TypeScript. It's really kind of simple, really, like I said before, you just have to convert all those files to be .ts instead of .js. So I have a script to kind of do that. So I have this refactor script here that takes all the JavaScript files and converts those to .js. So we're going to go to to do app and we're going to run this script. And then look at the to do app, which is here. So we're going to convert it to TypeScript. So we just ran that script and now we're going to compile the application. And so obviously, actually, I also need to, to copy over the tsconfig file. So let's run that again. So now if we compile this application, there's going to be a lot of errors because we wrote it in regular JavaScript. So these errors, like I said before, are non-blocking errors, but they still allow us to convert application to TypeScript. So as you can see, we have the TypeScript file, and then we have the compiled JavaScript file. We refresh this page, it's still going to be running because we're actually still having um, valid, valid JavaScript being outputted. So let's go back and talk about how we're compiling. Out of the box, we can use TypeScript to compile it. We can also use Webpack, Gulp, or Grunt. So let's look at the Gulp file. We're referencing Gulp, Gulp TypeScript, and then we're using, again, that tsconfig file that we specified before that has our configuration. And then we're passing in the TS project. Uh, we're passing in that to the JS pipe, and then we're outputting that to a dist directory. We could also use grunt to compile that as well. So again, we're using that TS config file, and we're converting all our TypeScript to JavaScript using the grunt TS package. We can also use I can't take that off. We're also using Grunt. Um, sorry, we can also use Webpack to convert it. So it kind of depends on your workflow and what works best for you to convert your files to JavaScript. 
So as you can see, if you're using React, you can also use TSX files as well. So let's take a vote. Who thinks, who thinks what is going to be the fastest for um, converting your TypeScript to JavaScript? So if you think Gulp is going to be fastest, raise your hand. OK, if you think it's going to be Webpack, raise your hand. OK, and if you think it's going to be TypeScript, raise your hand. So let's, let's see. Time TSC. So as we see, it takes 3.7 seconds for that. Time gulp. Takes about 4.95 seconds, so gulp is not the fastest. Grunt. Much slower in this case. 5.84 seconds, and we have some errors there. And then time, webpack. Four point three five seconds. So what's the fastest? So the fastest is actually webpack in this case. But of course, there's errors in our application because we have some JavaScript that's not actually, we have some TypeScript that's not very good um, TypeScript in this case. So as I said before, there are non-blocking errors. They're actually not going to stop our compilation. So as we can see, all we really need is a tsconfig file. And we can use different systems to compile our TypeScript to JavaScript. So it kind of depends on your workflow, what works best for you to compile down your TypeScript to JavaScript. So what does success in TypeScript look like? Type sanity. You know ahead of time what the types look like and what you're dealing with. So you can really, when you're building out your code, know exactly what you're dealing with and parameters and interface specifications. So it helps you when you're refactoring and building out your application. And once your application gets more mature, you know what you're dealing with and what, what um, types you have available at um, build time. And so that gives you confidence when you're refactoring or when you're a new dev taking over the projects to know, like, I have these types and these return types. Uh, Self-documenting code. So as I showed before, the function on the parameter specifies the type. So in the case before, we had a parameter that was a number. In regular JavaScript, we wouldn't know exactly what that number is. But with TypeScript, we can specify that number and know exactly what it's going to be. So that gives us some confidence. Like I said before, I'll forget some code I wrote two weeks ago. But if I come back to a TypeScript file, I can come back and say, hey, this is a number. And this is, returns back an object that is this iconfig type interface. So that gives us a lot of confidence we're developing to know ahead of time before we compile what we wrote and what the specifications for that interface were. Self-documenting code. We know, like I said before, exactly what we're going to get back. And say we're dealing with an API. And it's going to say we are hitting this API, and it returns back an interface that's specified ahead of time. So we can actually be confident in knowing that we're specifying the properties of this return type and the, the code is self-documenting. So that's it. Um, all my slides are in code or up on my um, GitHub. So if anyone has any questions or wants to submit a pull request to my presentation, please, please feel free to do it. And um, 
if you have any emails or uh, questions, feel free to email me. And uh, I guess we have time for questions, hopefully. Thank you. I think we might have time for a couple questions. Thanks for the talk. Um, do many libraries have TypeScript definitions at the moment? Yeah. Uh, it was introduced in 2012, so at this point there's actually pretty good um, adoption for TypeScript. And so the, the main ones, like React, Angular, of course, which is using TypeScript out of the box, have definitions. If there aren't explicit de definitions, you can always um, submit a pull request to, um, to definitely type repository. Um, and then if they don't have definitions or annotations, you can change the type of import you're using so that you can avoid having to have those explicit types. So a lot of times people say the blocker with using TypeScript is that the dependencies aren't specified, but there actually is a lot of support for that. And um, you could always write it yourself or just avoid that aspect entirely. Okay, thank you.